This morning we're finishing the eighth uh, psalm that we've chosen for the summer. I trust you've enjoyed it. Uh, we've heard a good response to each of the different psalms. We're in Psalm 130, so turn there in your Bible, Psalm 130. It's a song of ascents, A-S-C-E-N-T-S, going up, and it's one of the psalms in Psalm 120 to 134 that the people of Israel, when they had their annual pilgrimage festivals to Mount Zion, to Jerusalem, uh, would sing as they were going up, as they were traveling to Jerusalem and as they were making their way literally up through the Kidron Valley to the southern part of the city of David and then eventually uh, after the temple was built up to the Temple Mount as well. So it's uh, interesting to think about that ancient cultural context. We don't know who the author of this psalm is. You can see some of the other songs of ascent. Uh, psalm 127 by Solomon. There's another one that's mentioned here, 131 by David doesn't say who the author is here, but it's Psalm 130, uh, verses 1 through 8. If you'd be so kind this morning as to stand and respectfully listen to God's Word as I read Psalm 130, a song of ascents. Out of the depths I cry to you, O Lord. O Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive to the voice of my pleas for mercy. If you, O Lord should mark iniquities, O Lord, who could stand? So one of the reasons why I picked this psalm is because that's a favorite recent modern song that I enjoy singing, but it's a truth that humbles me whenever I think of it. But with you there is forgiveness, purpose, that you may be feared. I wait for the Lord, my soul waits, and in His word I hope, my soul waits for the Lord. More than watchmen for the morning. More than watchmen for the morning. O Israel, hope in the Lord. For with the Lord there is steadfast love. And with Him is plentiful redemption. And He will redeem Israel from all His iniquities. Psalm 130. Please be seated. What's the greatest gift you and I could ever receive? It would be absolutely incredible if someone said, here's a brand new house or even a used house or whatever kind of house, and it's just completely paid for and it's free. It's yours. You can have it. Uh, or uh, a brand new car if you needed a new car. It'd be a great gift. Uh, I remember one time many years ago in one of the former free churches that I served, I mentioned that when I was at the YMCA, someone had stolen my watch uh, out of my jacket, and uh, by uh, Monday morning, I had three watches on my desk. <laughs> so guess what? Somebody stole my wife's car this last week. Just wanted, <laughs> just in case, you know, the greatest gift we could receive would be. <laughs> now, we love our 2007 Mercury Grand Marquis. So uh, what would be the greatest gift you could ever receive? Uh, just a great vacation or, or, uh, or, or healing, physical healing, or the list could go on and on. What would be the greatest gift you and I could ever give? Well, I would submit to you based on this passage this morning that hands down, more than anything else, knowing the Bible storyline, knowing the fact that God does exist, He's real, that He's created us as human beings to be in a relationship with Him, but that we have a problem. It's our rebellion, our sin, our mutiny against the God who created us, that the greatest gift, bar none, that we could ever receive is forgiveness. Amen? Without it, we're lost. Without it, there's no reconciliation between us and God. And as a result, even horizontally between us and others. And without it, there's no restoration in relationships. The greatest gift we could ever receive is forgiveness. One writer has said in reference to Psalm 130, we, and this is so true, have lost the sense of guilt that comes from realizing who we are in the presence of the Holy One. We've lost the sense of guilt that comes from realizing who we are in the presence of the Holy One. <laughs> Even do this? Nah. Nah. It's just God. 
We've lost a sense of guilt that comes from realizing who we are in the presence of the Holy One. Well, let's take a look at Psalm 130 and pick it apart together. It's pretty easy to break the psalm down. If you look at it, you'll see there are four sets of two verses. It's Hebrew poetry. So oftentimes what's used in the first line is set a separate way or a different way in the second line, but there are a lot of parallels between the two, and we'll pick up on that a little bit here this morning. And since there are four sets of two, guess how many points I'm going to have? The text drives how many points we have. There are four points, the first two coupled together and the second two coupled together as well. But for our purposes, we'll take a look at four different things. So let me first submit to us this morning that we should ask no matter what our need is. Ask God. Pray. Ask. No matter what your need is. We'll get to the second point in just a minute and you'll see what the need was. He tells us, but at the very beginning, the psalmist says, out of the depths I cry. We talked about that in one of our earlier psalms. I cry to you. This is not some sort of passionate plea. It's coming out of the depths. That phrase in the Old Testament has the imagery that's expressive of universal human experience. And it's often linked with Sheol or the grave, out of the grave, out of the, the place of dying, the pit, silence, darkness, destruction, out of the dust, out of the mire, out of the slime, out of the mud. Those are all images that come out of the Old Testament when we think of this term depths. Out of the depths I cry to you, O Lord. And it's not just a simple whimpering plea, but it's a crying, and you can tell there's desperation. And the desperation is for God. Eight times in these eight verses, a couple different forms of God's name is used, and you see it repeated over and over again. Out of the depths I cry to you, O Lord, Yahweh, O Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive to the voice of my pleas for mercy. Please, plural. Asking God, no matter what our need is, to intervene. This I cry is an intense emotion expressed from deep personal need. And even as I said in the introduction, we've lost a sense of guilt that comes from realizing who we are, how needy we really, really are. Here's what I think makes evangelism very difficult in our culture today. The average person doesn't think they need anything. And the average person doesn't think that their sin is so bad before God, even if they would recognize it as sin in our culture where pretty much so anything goes. Here, the psalmist is crying with intense emotion out of deep personal need. Pleading for what? Mercy. I love that term. Oh Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears, plural, anthropomorphism. God doesn't have ears, but the picture so that we can understand. As if the psalmist is saying, Lord, lean over to hear with your ears. Be attentive like leaning over to the voice of my pleas, plural, for mercy. I love that part of who God is. Mercy is the aspect of God's love that causes him to help the needy or those in miserable, rejected, or unfortunate situations. Mercy is both withheld judgment, that's what we deserve, and it's active blessing and God's help for us. Perhaps you remember in the Old Testament, the Ark of the Covenant that represented God's presence had the Ten Commandments, some manna, Aaron's rod in it, and so on. But do you remember what was on the top of it? There was a cover what kind of cover was it? It's made out of what? Gold. And what was it called? It was called a seat. What kind of seat? Mercy seat. God's mercy to sinful Israelites and to sinful Gentiles like you and me. Notice how the psalmist makes prayer first, not last with any need. Here's where we could pause and sing, and trust me, I won't be the interim worship leader, <laughs> but we could pause and sing, Lord, I need you. Oh, how much I need you. We'll see what the uh, immediate uh, context was for this, but let me just pause here and encourage you this morning, if you're tiring in prayer, if you haven't prayed, if you're up against the wall in some situation in your life as a single person, as a married person, if you feel like life is overwhelming, do what the psalmist does, cry out passionately, intensely to God. He wants us to come to Him. 
in the humble brokenness and desire for him to intervene. Ask no matter what your need is, our need is. Notice, secondly, be confident that God forgives our sins. Be confident that God forgives our sins. And here it's hard for me not to get emotional. I can't hardly sing the song and not have tears come to my eyes. If you, O Lord, should mark transgressions, iniquities, sins, O Lord, who could stand? If you, Yahweh, could, should mark iniquities, keep track of all of our sins, O Lord, Adonai, who could stand? Stand where? In front of you. Could stand your judgment. Be confident God forgives our sins. The doctrine of the forgiveness of sins is so clear in this psalm in the Old Testament that Martin Luther, the great reformer, called it a Pauline psalm, a psalm that Paul could have written had he been there in the Old Testament. Why the cry in verses 1 and 2? Here we're told, yes, we can apply verses 1 and 2 to any need that we have, but in particular, verses 3 and 4 tell us why the psalmist was crying out in verses 1 and 2. It's because of guilt for a sin, her sin. If you, Yahweh, should mark our iniquities, is there anything deficient in God's, get the terms right, Olson, omniscience? No. Does God actually keep track? There's a passage in Matthew that says, we'll give an account for every word we say. Is God aware of every possible sin in our lives? Yes, or every sin that we've conv- uh, committed. Absolutely. We think of things like uh, passages that say that God says He'll remember our sins no more, but don't misinterpret a passage like that. There's nothing faulty in God's omniscience. It would be great if God would forget the things that I did when I was 20 years old or as a teenager, or as a young dad, or as a middle-aged man. It'd be great if God would forget those things, but the Bible says, remember our sins no more. That does not mean that there's something faulty in God's omniscience. He knows all things. When it says He remembers our sins no more, they're as far as the east is from the west, it means simply that He will never bring those sins up against us again because they've been paid for when we confess and repent. I wish God would forget. I can't even forget. And certainly He doesn't forget. And maybe some of the small ones we don't remember. But whether they're small or big, when a believer and follower of Jesus confesses and repents of his or her sin, washed clean by the blood, is that good news or what? Is that good news or what? Oh Lord, if you should keep track of our iniquities, Here's where indeed we're humbled very, very quickly because we're mindful of them. And would it be that God would stand there with a booklet and be writing down every single one of them and we would be standing before Him. Mark that one, something you did. By the way, mark that one, something you didn't do. Sins of omission as well as commission. We can be confident that God forgives our sins. In Psalm 32, verses 1 to 5, earlier, one we did not preach on, but a very familiar and famous psalm. Blessed is the one whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered, David proclaimed. Blessed is the man against whom the Lord counts no iniquity, and in whose spirit there is no deceit. David reflecting on his life, his adultery, his Party to murder. When I kept silent, my bones wasted away, though my groaning, through my groaning all day long. For day and night your hand was heavy upon me, convicting him. He was living under guilt. My strength was dried up as by the heat of summer. I acknowledged my sin to you, and I did not cover my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave the iniquity of my sin. God does know everything. But he extends his forgiveness. Here's one of the great phrases in the Bible. But with you there is forgiveness. The fact of forgiveness. Exodus 34, 6-8. 
The Lord passed in front of Moses, proclaiming, The Lord, the Lord, the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, everybody say amen to that, abounding in love and faithfulness, maintaining love to thousands, and forgiving wickedness, rebellion, and sin. And how did Moses respond in Exodus 34? He bowed to the ground at once and worshiped. Or Isaiah 55, 6 and 7. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call on him while he's near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the evil man his thoughts. Let him turn to the Lord and he, God, will have mercy on him and to our God for he, God, will freely pardon or from Proverbs 16, 6, through love and faithfulness, God's love and faithfulness to himself and to us, sin is atoned for on the cross. Through the fear of the Lord, a man avoids evil, which is a good segue to the end of verse 4. If you, O Lord, should mark iniquities, O Lord, who could stand? But with you there is forgiveness, and here's the purpose, that you may be feared. To fear God. One writer has said, since God is more powerful than sin, and only He can overcome it, He is to be feared. Since God, only God, is more powerful than sin, and only He can overcome it, He is to be feared. Or from the pen of one famous famous preacher many years ago, it seems to me that when you stand before God, convicted and condemned, and you have a noose around your neck, and God pardons your sins, you then weep for joy, hate the evil which you have been forgiven, and live to the honor of the Redeemer by whose blood you have been cleansed. You fear God because you know that He had every reason to condemn you, but He did not. But He did not. If you, O Lord, should mark our transgressions, who could stand? Not me. Not any one of us in this room here today. But with you, because of your mercy, there's forgiveness of sins. Ask no matter what your need is, be confident God forgives our sin. And then notice how the psalmist goes on because while this truth is being proclaimed personally, He proclaims corporately to the people of Israel, as we'll see at the end, and to us, how important it is to wait patiently, hoping in His Word. That's my title this morning, Finding Our Hope in the Lord. To wait patiently, hoping hoping in His Word. Notice wait is mentioned three times in verses 5 and 6, and we're given an ancient illustration that would have been very, very familiar to people. I wait for who? For the Lord. My soul waits My thinking, my feeling, my choosing, it waits for who? For the Lord. And here's the parallel in the Hebrew poetry. And in His Word, I hope. We wait with hope. We have hope, so we wait. They're explaining the same concept and they're integrally tied together. My soul waits for the Lord. You draw your hope from God's Word, waiting upon the Lord. Hope is in the promises of God which come from His nature. We'll see that in just a minute. He's a covenant keeping God. I recorded these promises in his word. And the illustration is a watchman. You can go to Samaria today outside of the city of Jerusalem. Judea and Samaria. In the Judean hills you'll see it some too. But in particular in Samaria there's a lot of terraced uh, territory. And uh, there are rock walls for the terracing, olive trees often growing uh, in and around those areas. And then you will see periodically the remains of ancient watchtowers. Certainly cities would have a watchtower, have in ancient times, and many do even to this day. But you have uh, these remains of ancient watchtowers. And what do you do in a watchtower, especially when the harvest is coming? You have someone in the watchtower, and they're up all night long, so no thieves come in, but probably more importantly, no animals come in to take care of the crop and eat it up. And so a watchtower is very, very important. 
very important. I remember one summer many, many years ago when I was just actually had started college and then I quit after my younger brother was killed and I worked for a couple, three years. And one summer I went to work for my cousin not right up on the uh, border between uh, Minnesota and North Dakota, not far from where I grew up. And I worked in a grain elevator and I would, there were three layers to the grain elevator, it processed sunflower seeds and they had great big open doors that slid open, no rail. I don't like heights. You could sit there and let your feet dangle and look down and stuff like that. I didn't do that. But uh, I would stand by the doorway out in the flat plains of the Red River Valley and I had to stay awake. And I'll tell you, I was watching and waiting for the morning. Just watching and waiting for the morning. So here the psalmist is telling us, wait patiently. Hope in His Word. Broadly, it could be applied to anything that we're facing. But here in particular, it's the hope that comes from knowing that our sins are forgiving, waiting and hoping, closely tied together. And what would be the testimony of perhaps all of us? It's not easy to wait, is it? There's patience. Now we have instant forgiveness of sins, but if we apply this in a broader way to other things that we're waiting for, some breakthrough in our lives, in our families, or whatever the case might be, uh, it's not easy to be patient but here the psalmist is encouraging the people of Israel, you know what, wait, wait, wait for the Lord. Hope, hope, hope in His Word. Be patiently enduring, knowing that God is a good God, and He'll bring deliverance, He'll bring breakthrough, He'll always bring forgiveness when we confess and repent. There is no forgiveness without confession and repentance. There's no reconciliation without confession and repentance. God doesn't just willy-nilly forgive us. There's first confession and repentance. And when we confess and repent, His forgiveness and His grace comes to us. And so we wait for that freeing grace in our hearts and in our lives. So our text asks, no matter what your need is, be confident God forgives our sin. Wait patiently, hoping in the Lord and in His Word. And then be encouraged. The best is yet to come. Be encouraged. The best is yet to come. Now, let me just say this. So important for us to understand that when Christ came and lived and died on the cross, he paid the price for all sin once for all. Mind blower. Hard to believe one guy could die. or Only a, a God guy could die. The God man could die once for all for all sin. Just stop and think about that. I, I can't get my cranium around it. That one person named Jesus Christ could die on a cross to pay the price for all the sin and rebellion and mutiny of all human beings in the world if they will confess and repent and trust in Him. That's what the Bible teaches. And so we have before us a promise of Israel to Israel and to us when we get to the New Testament. Hope in the Lord. There it is again. For with the Lord there is hesed, steadfast love, and with him is plentiful redemption, and he will redeem Israel, future tense, from all his iniquities. It's a messianic verse, the last verse. And uh, it's before us here in our text this morning. Be encouraged, the best is yet to come. So back to my point I started to make, and there was the temporary brain freeze from sleep deprivation. And remember that when Jesus died on the cross, apply it to you individually, he paid for all of your sin, past, present, and future. Past, present, and future. All of it paid for through his completed work for you and me on the cross. With the Lord, with Yahweh, there is steadfast love. And with him is plentiful redemption. And he will redeem Israel. Here it's a promise corporately to Israel from all of his, Israel's, iniquities, a messianic promise. Deliverance often comes in the morning after we've experienced the time of night and darkness. Earlier it was hope in the Lord, in, in the Word, and now it's hope in the Lord. Why? Because he is a God of steadfast love and plentiful redemption or ransom. He's purchased. He's paid the price. He's redeemed us. God himself will redeem Israel. How? Through the finished work of of Jesus Christ on the cross, Jew and Gentile alike. And so we end with the gospel. We end with the gospel. O Israel, hope in the Lord. O Gentiles here today listening, our hope is in the Lord. With Him there's steadfast love and plentiful redemption. 
And one day He will indeed set us free even from the presence of sin when He comes again or when He calls us home. Finding our hope, in particular the forgiveness of sins, in the Lord, through His Word, and through the completed work of Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Father, thank You for this morning. Thank You for Your Word. Thank You for a shorter passage today. Uh, Thank You also for the opportunity that we have in these next few minutes to uh, express publicly our gratitude for partnership in the Gospel with Pastor Dorcom and Mala and the family. I pray, Lord, that You would bless and encourage them even as we'll pray in just a few minutes. We pray, Lord, that if we've not experienced, based on this passage, the forgiveness of our sins, that you would remove from us any sense, if we've never bowed the knee and trusted in you, remove from us any sense that we'll be able to stand in your presence and say it's not a big deal. It is a big deal. And there is no way outside of your mercy and your grace and your shedding of blood that our mutiny and rebellion and sin against you can be overlooked. So keep us humble, Lord, knowing that. Lord, if you marked our transgressions or iniquities, who would stand? As that phrase has often been in my heart and mind because of that song and this text, Lord, I pray that it would be in our hearts and minds as well. Not to force us into some sort of worm theology or just worthless, but to humbly help us recognize there's no room for pride. It's only by your grace and your mercy that you've opened our eyes to see and to know and experience this good news that you've come and done for us what we could never do for ourselves, paid the price for our sins. Thank you for your mercy this morning. And give us a soft, humble heart that bows the knee as we did earlier, physically or in our hearts, that crouches down low in your presence, not in some sort of arrogant, pompous way that you'd strip us of pride and give us great humility in the presence of an awesome, holy, and just God. And Lord, as we go out into the world today and this week, give us boldness not to beat people up with the gospel, but to help them see as we open the scriptures very carefully that good people don't make it to heaven. They're sinners in need of a Savior. And they will face judgment outside of you. We'll hear that, Lord, in the book of Revelation. I pray that we would hear it and be mindful of it even this morning. Not easy, but so very important. So encourage us, Lord. Thank you that we can ask you for anything we need. Maybe it is forgiveness and we're living under the guilt of past sin. Remind us that as we've confessed and repented, you have washed us clean whiter than snow. Maybe it's some other great need that we're crying out for. Thank you, Lord, that you're a God of mercy with our sin and in so many other ways as well. We thank you for your love that we've sung about this morning. May it permeate and fill our hearts and minds today. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.